I want to talk about what this last part of the course is about. Okay? So you remember, we talked in the first part of the course about motion on Earth, and then in the second part of the course we talked about motion in the heavens, and now we're going to try to get to the synthesis of motion in heaven and motion on Earth, and that synthesis is based on this part where the scientists of this time actually were in influenced by a religious idea in cosmos that God who made the planetary system is a master clockmaker okay and we needed to figure out what is the mechanism of the clockwork universe that God put this together and Kepler's laws were of course the first thing and so one of the things that Newton who actually did this synthesis came through is uh, the idea of the mechanical universe. And even today, you know, we, we borrow that idea when we say, if we're trying, you know, you can do it in psychology, you can do it in biology. Whenever you're trying to explain a phenomenon, you'll say, what is the, me the, me the, me what is the me mechanism of this phenomenon? Okay, what is the, you, when you say, what is the mechanism of the phenomenon, you are harking back to this period where uh, the scientists were influenced by this uh, paradigm that all we have to do is come up with a mechanical explanation of the construction of the solar system and then we will understand everything. All right, so that's why uh, we, will, uh, we won't cover again the motion on Earth, which is horizontal motion and vertical motion, which we talked about, and also two-dimensional motion, which is parabolic motion, which we talked about. Uh, but we will talk more about pendulum motion, because we did talk about that a little, we talked about that a little bit, pendulum motion. And we'll show you the one motion that we did not talk about a lot is circular motion okay and what we're going to show you is that pendulum motion and circular motion are intimately connected and that gives me my chance now to show you the demonstration for today so here I have a pendulum okay and here I have circular motion so everybody can see the the nail on the circular motion and I'm going to show you that these two motions are intimately related okay and so in order to understand this motion you need to understand this motion and when you understand the motion of the pendulum you'll understand how clocks are governed because clocks are regulated by pendulum at least the early clocks were regulated by pendulum and when you understand circular motion then you can understand how the planets in the whole solar system behave so that's how the whole thing comes together okay all right, so now I need to show you, of, of course, there's no connection obvious now, right? But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn on this light. Of course, if I blow it, then that'll be the end of the demonstration. Okay. All right, so now you can see the shadow of the circular motion, and you can see the pendulum motion, all right? Uh, and what I'm going to do is, oh, I'm going to do it from, I think I'm going to do it from here so you can see it better. All right. All right. So otherwise I, I'll get in the way. All right. So if you follow the shadow of the circular motion, if I do it right, if you follow the shadow of the circular motion, you'll see that ooh, the shadow of the circular motion is the same as pendulum motion. Okay, so if you have an object going in a circle, right, and you just take its shadow, then that motion is exactly the same as pendulum motion, right? So in order to understand pendulum motion, you have to understand circular motion. So that's what we're going to do uh, in chapter 10, is we're going to first understand circular motion, then we're going to use that to understand pendulum motion. And then later on, we will use circular motion to understand the motion of the planets. But now let me go to the main, sci main scientist of this period. Now Descartes also made a very important breakthrough in understanding circular motion and that's what I'm going to show you in my next demo. And, uh, and I hope you guys can see this well. So what you're supposed to see here is a little motor car okay, and a spring. All right, Everybody see the spring? And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spin this guy. okay, and before I spin it, I want to show you that the position of this motor car depends on how far the spring is pulled out. Okay, so if I pull this motor car all the way here, right, 
then the spring is stretched, right? You can see the spring stretched, right? So what does that mean? It means that when the spring is stretched, it's, there's something pulling the car back to the, to the center. Remember that now. Very important, okay? In fact, we're going to make a word based on that. We call, we're going to call it centripetal. Centripetal, okay? Every pointing to the center, okay? So if the spring expands this way, means that the spring is trying to pull the car to the center, okay? Now what Descartes realized without the spring, okay, now I'm showing this to you with the spring because of all, our, all the, the genius that we have with the ages, but Descartes realized this without the benefit of the spring, that if I now turn this thing on and make circular motion, can everybody see the, the car now going in circles, right? And it'll, it'll take a little while for, for this turntable to speed up, but watch where the car is as I increase the speed of circular motion. So I'm going to move it faster and faster. And can you see what happens to the position of the motor when the speed of this thing is very fast? All right? OK. Now, so what does this mean? That the faster this goes, the further out the motor is here. Right? That means that it's being pulled stronger and stronger to the center. Okay? So the faster this motion, the more the pulling towards the center. And this is what Descartes realized, is that let's just take this motor here now and go like this. Now no spring, okay? That if something is going in a circular motion, it's actually being pulled to the center. All right? That's, that's what he realized. This is a fantastic realization because it then relates back to, aha, the planets are going around the sun. That means something is pulling the planets to the sun. Okay. And that gave um, Newton the idea of gravity. Okay. Namely, gravity is pulling the planets, gravity from the sun is pulling the planets in. But that only came after Descartes realized that this is the essential part of circular motion. Namely, circular motion is not, especially in the heavens, it's not natural motion. Okay. Circular motion requires an outside interference. Okay. And it was Descartes who realized that in order for an object to go in a circle and change its path, there has to be something that's pulling it in towards the center, something centripetal. Okay? So the first part, you can see uh, that if the, bo the body is moving in a circle and you cut the string that, that holds it to the center, then the body will just fly in a straight line. Okay? And in order for the body to move in the circle, you need this string to keep it moving in the circle. In other words, you keep this force. The other aspect of this you realize is that suppose you are in a car, right? And your car is going straight. Now you already know that when the car is going straight and then somebody applies brakes, then you're going to go you know, flying. Or if your car is at stationary and all of a sudden you accelerate, then you're going to sort of fall back because you want to maintain your previous state of motion. But what happens if the car wants to go in a circle? Okay? If the car wants to go in a circle, you kind of tr want to try to fly this way. And so that leads you to this next question for you to figure out that, well, let me take this uh, demonstration lights off so it doesn't interfere with the, what you're looking at. That suppose, uh, as I just discussed, if you have this car that accelerates, right, then you get pushed, you feel, you feel like you're left behind, right? And if you have a car that's, that's, that's uh, moving fast and somebody applies the brakes, right, braking, then this is what happens to you. So now based on these two behaviors, figure out what is the acceleration here, right? Here, the, here you know that when the car speeds up, that the acceleration is this way. And here you know that when you're braking, the acceleration is this way, right? So the question for you is to figure out what is the, so what did you get? Aha, we got a distribution here. All right, but A is correct. Uh, um, let's see why, right? Just look, look at what's happening to the people. I already gave you the answer, right? See what's happening to the people here, right? Compare it to what's happening to them here. It's the same thing. Or compare it to what's happening to them here. It's again the same thing. And in each case, the acceleration is this way, this way, which means it's this way. Okay, so when you go in a circle, you feel like you're being left behind, which is, uh, you know, the, uh, the the effect of being, you know, in order to go in a circle, you need to be pulled towards the center, 
and that's not going to be happening. Okay, so now we're, come, we're building up from Descartes' idea that what is the basis of circular motion? Okay, so when circular motion takes place, you have acceleration, and acceleration takes place when the speed changes. Okay, we know that, right? Because when you're braking or you're speeding up, we have acceleration. But acceleration also takes place when direction changes. Okay. And you need an external agent in both cases, okay? So the speed does not change when you're going in circular motion, like on that table, but the direction is changing constantly, okay? So circular motion is accelerated motion, like that example uh, of going around the bend. And the way you deal with this changing direction is by dealing with this math new mathematical quantity called vectors, okay? So vectors, the idea of vectors actually came up with during uh, the effort to have sailing on the ocean. Okay, so now let me do this wonderful example of sailing on the ocean over here with this uh, with this little uh, boat that I have, and uh, let me let me put it over here so everybody can see it better, right? And I'm going to take this off for now, and I'm going to put this. So what I have here is a cart, and um, a, uh, not Descartes, <laughs> uh, a motor that's going to, just like the propeller on an airplane or the propeller on a ship, in a ship when the propeller goes it pushes the water this way so the ship moves forward like this, right? Okay, alright. So now what one does during sailing, of course if I put this up here and put it exactly flat, right? What's going to happen? I, I, was, I was going to make that a question, but I decided not to. Uh, what's going to happen if I now turn it on? Is it going to go this way or is it going to go this way? Yeah, right. Nothing's, essentially nothing's going to happen. It's just going to stand still because the air is trying to make it propel, propel this way, but then when the air hits this guy, right, he tries to make it go the other way. Okay? So that's why it just stands there. All right. Now, if you're a sailor, right, then you're going to be using all these clever techniques, some of which we will discuss, where you use the speed of the air to make you move in one particular direction independent of how the air is moving. Okay? So even if the wind is coming at you, you want to go this way, against the wind. Right? All right. So then you have to arrange your sail in a certain way to go that way. And the way you do that is by, by dealing with vectors. Okay? And I'll show you, uh, first I'll just demonstrate to you, and then maybe next time I'll show you the vector analysis of that motion. Okay? All right. So, first of all, this, this is a sail, and the reason it's going to work now is because it has a special shape. Okay? So I'm going to just place it over here and show you the result that um, the, the wind is blowing this way, and I want to go that way, right? So, which is, sorry, yeah, so normally the uh, effort will be. Uh, the, the result will be that the cart wants to go this way because it's propelling the wind this way. But by shaping the flow of the wind around the cart, I can make... Okay, I have to do this, I have to do this on a frictionless surface. So let me do this here. Because um, I, I have too much friction over there. Uh, let me go back over here. And put that over there. Okay. See, now we're going that way even though the wind is, is blowing in such a way that the, the natural tendency will be to go that way. All right? So I'm using the flow of air over the sail in order to push the, the boat towards the way that it does not normally want to go. Okay? So that's the basic idea behind uh, some of the te technology of sailing. This vector math uh, is based on the definition of what vectors do as a mathematical object and this will lead you into the section tomorrow that will discuss that vectors uh, are just like arrows that tell you the direction of where you need to go to get somewhere like Japan you need to go in this direction but they also tell you how much you need to go okay so if you look at this vector it says Japan is 6700 miles away and that means that Japan okay that this vector is 6,800 miles in this direction, but if you want to go to Scotland, then you need to go 5,000 miles in this direction, and if you want to go to 
Kathmandu, Nepal, and they're going to go 10,000 miles in this direction. And that basically defines these vectors that tell you in which direction you have to go and how big they are. All right. So now I'm going to apply it to circular motion. All right. So this, this object is going to go in a circle, all right? Like that. Now, when it goes in a circle, there are several arrows on this disk that are changing, all right? So I want you to go through this one at a time. This arrow represents the velocity of this point, okay? And notice that the velocity is changing as this thing goes into the circle, right? So first, over here, it's uh, pointing to my to my back, and then over here is pointing to the front. So the velocity is changing. All right, not only is the velocity changing, but also the, if I say that, uh, that I look at, say, this point, its velocity is also changing, but its location, the location of this point is also changing. And this vector from here to there defines the location of that point. Okay? And both of these changes, velocity and location, are represented by vectors. Vector, this is a vector, and this is a vector. This vector would have an arrow like this. Now what I'm going to derive is the change of the velocity from here to here, and that would be the acceleration, and you will see that the acceleration for here points towards the center of the circle, which is what we showed you before with Descartes' experiment of that little motor car racing on this same thing but horizontally. So I'm going to show you that the result of that velocity change is acceleration, but that acceleration points to the center. Okay, so we'll do the vector math to prove that. Get this out of the way. So this again is in the book, so don't worry about taking notes very carefully, okay? So there's that point, it's moving, and here's the circular motion, the radius vector is changing. Now, when it was here, the velocity is like this, and when it's here, the velocity is like this. And let's suppose the speed is the same, right? It's not slowing down, it's not speeding up. So the change of time from here to here is, let's call it, delta t, all right? So now I need to find the acceleration, okay? And remember, I explained to you that acceleration means change of velocity divided by time passed, time interval. Change of velocity means v final minus v initial divided by delta t. So I need to figure out this. This would be the delta v over t. So I write down v initial like this. And v final, uh, okay, this should, okay, this is this is v initial, right? And then I need to do v final, which is this, and I need to subtract v final minus v initial, and that's in order to do that, I have to flip the sign for v initial. So therefore, v final minus v initial is the addition of these two vectors, and that's what this is: v final minus v initial. And look at the resultant vector; it's pointing this way. So now if I pick up that vector, right, remember vectors have no home. You can pick a vector up and put it anywhere. If I pick up that vector and put it there, you see where it points, the center of the circle. So Vf minus Vi equals delta V, and delta V is centripetal. Okay, that's what you call centripetal acceleration. This V squared over R is the acceleration. You don't need to remember all this derivation. I just wanted to show you how using vectors is important. So the magnitude of the acceleration is V squared over R. So here we have um, an object going in a circle, all right? When you go on a roller coaster, you need to put your seat belts on, right? Otherwise, you fall off the track. But what's really true is that you don't need seat belts. Don't try it, but that's really true. And here, here's the, you saw what happened when I did this, right? It fell. However, if you started at the proper place, okay? You don't need seat belts. You won't fall down. Okay? And the reason you won't fall down is because if your speed here is big enough, then v squared over r equals g. And because of g, you're not going this way. You're going this way. Right? So try it. No, don't try it. <laughs> or, you know, those, those, for example, if you get sick on a roller coaster, if you happen to throw up when you're here, right? That stuff is not going to fall. It's going to stay with you. <laughs> because, right, it's like uh, the guy on the satellite, right, that uh, lets go a golf ball and the golf ball just hangs there. It's exactly the same thing, is that your velocity in this direction is such that v squared over r is equal to g. Okay. 
it's Descartes idea to organize the motion of uh, the circular motion and look at the projection of the circular motion on one axis okay so if you have something moving in a circle and you look at the projection of that on the x-axis that whole idea is a Cartesian idea and that idea came from this guy Descartes of how to organize space okay and that was a very important evolution of the period of the Baroque you know the Baroque period is the period in which Galileo did most of his scientific work and this, this is the basic idea of Cartesian geometry, right? That you can take any point in space and you define an x-axis an and a y-axis and then you define how many uh, steps this point is along the x-axis and how many steps it's along the y-axis. And then you have two coordinates called x and y that give you the, the position of this object. And then, of course, Descartes went much further than what I'm doing over here. Formed this beautiful uh, rectangular, I would say almost Cartesian pattern, okay? And so... I'm trying to point out to you is that, that, that this idea of Descartes was actually born at the same time as the idea of the Baroque that there has to be some structure. Okay, so, if you, so if you look at the music of the time, you'll see more and more structural elements of the music of the Baroque. Okay? <clears throat> All right, so now coming back to the science, you've got this simple harmonic motion, and the reason we call it simple harmonic motion, here's my last video, yes, okay. So if you have an object going around in a circle. I am now projecting the Cartesian projections of this object. And so this is the x-axis motion here. And that's your pendulum. Okay. And I can also look at the y-axis motion of its shadow. And that's also a pendulum motion. But then what I can do is I can plot over here the x-position, the x-position as a function of time. And so at a, at a given time, its x-position is going to be zero. And then the x-position grows. Okay, and then the exposition falls to zero, and the exposition grows, and you get this what we call the sine wave. Okay, and this sine wave is exactly the pattern of the way in which a string vibrates when it's plucked. Okay, so this is a harmonic motion, and that's why the motion of a pendulum is called simple harmonic motion because this projection motion, when plotted x versus time or y versus time, is either this sine theta or cosine theta, which is like the motion. Uh, of, of this vibrating string.